One, one thing, though, uh, in, in response to this, um, you know, I, uh, I think that one thing that's important to keep in mind is that very little of what uh, this administration or the Bush administration uh, did was actually new ideas. Um, there, there, were, there were old existing ideas and resurrections of certain plans and, and, and programs. I mean, if you look at the Phoenix program in Vietnam, which was this assassination program that was being run in Vietnam, there are very serious parallels to what the United States was doing in Iraq. You know, people, the, the dominant historical narrative is that the surge won the Iraq war. And General you know, Petraeus, uh, had he not gone down for you know, the, the only thing that seems to be capable of taking down the powerful is this, you know, what, 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 they, uh, what they do in their top secret chambers. Um, <laughs> Uh, they can wage all the so-called secret wars they want, but if they do something in their own secret life, then you know, that, then you can you can bring them down. But but Petraeus is often celebrated as this sort of hero who won the Iraq War because of the surge. But in reality, you had this merciless killing campaign that was being run by General Stanley McChrystal and Admiral William McRaven, where they were just bumping off uh, you know the leadership of any cell that would pop off pop up, but also just killing a tremendous number of people in general. And, uh, and, and so you, you had uh, military figures that grew up in a certain era with an understanding of these programs. And when, uh, when Cheney and Rumsfeld came into power with, with Bush, um, they really saw, even before 9-11 happened, saw the, the historical moment that they had in front of them to sort of redraw maps and, uh, and implement uh, a vision of the world where Iran-Contra was a noble act um, and, and sort of the model for how the U.S. should be conducting its foreign policy. I don't know if, you, if many of you know this, but Cheney was in Congress at the time that Iran-Contra was being investigated, and he um, authored the minority report in the House uh, defending Iran-Contra um, and, and, and viewed it as a sort of heroic, necessary action. And, and they, they had this view of the unitary executive, the idea that when it comes to these uh, national security issues, that the White House is a, essentially a dictatorship, and that Congress's only function is to fund the operations but not be involved with overseeing them or having any meaningful oversight of these operations. And President Obama really had an opportunity to roll back some of the executive branch power grabs that Bush and, and Cheney had engaged in, and instead he sort of doubled down on them and, and has been waging an unprecedented war against uh, whistleblowers, and using the Espionage Act, um, and reserving the right of the state to keep secret from the American people uh, evidence that would, would indicate uh, why someone was being assassinated, to keep secret, to use the state secrets privilege in repeated lawsuits brought against former officials or torturers, um, having cases thrown out of court, using the full power structure of the executive branch in the same excessive way that was being used under uh, Bush and Cheney. Jeremy, you uh, were talking about U.S. officials. Noam, if you could respond to what Jeremy said, and also you have written extensively about the killing of Osama bin Laden, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. The killing of Osama bin Laden, I must say, is one of the more, I've it's written a lot of unpopular so things. I'll hold that. You hold that. Okay. Sorry, I can't hold it. <laughs> President Ford, who couldn't be done. <laughs> I was saying that I've written plenty of unpopular articles, and one of the most unpopular had to do with the murder, not killing, of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was a suspect. Uh, there are principles, believe it or not, that are not only in the Constitution, but that go back to 800 years to Magna Carta, foundations of Anglo-American law. That's, um, they put it in narrow terms, but the general principle, including Jeremy's quite correct expansion of it to people other than our own citizens, uh, is that a person can't be uh, 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 punished by the state without due process in, of law and a speedy trial by his peers. That's a reasonable principle that's in the Constitution. It's narrow if you look. So in the Constitution, 
didn't naturally didn't apply to Native Americans, it didn't apply to blacks, and it dubiously applied to women who at the time were considered property, not people. But over the years it's been expanded and unless it gets to the point where the Jeremy was talking about where it's just human beings, uh, we can't call ourselves a civilized society. Anyway, those are the principles. Osama bin Laden was a suspect. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a, uh, personally, I don't have any doubt that he was responsible, but my personal opinion is nothing that stands up in a court of law. You have to have evidence, you have to have a trial, a serious trial, and it was pretty clear that the U.S. government didn't want that. He was captured, apprehended, by you know, the most skilled uh, masters of war, to use the Somali warlord's uh, expression, that exists in the world, uh, 80 of them, I think. He was defenseless. Uh, the first story that came out was that they had to shoot him because uh, his wife lunged at the seals. <laughs> but that story was later withdrawn. There was nothing. It was just apprehended, defenseless, uh, murdered, uh, body thrown into the ocean, uh, leaving obvious questions as to why. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the dangers of this operation, a lot of the aspects of this operation so it was a criminal, it might be just a, total, a complete criminal act, uh, no justification. Uh, but there's more to it than this. And I was kind of reminded of it when Jeremy talked about the, uh, uh, the Yemeni uh, testimony at the Senate. And those of you might have looked at the little tiny report on that in the New York Times. He said something else, this man who testified. He said that for years, the uh, Al Qaeda, the Islamist radicals, Al Qaeda, we call them, had been trying to turn the people of this village against the Americans, and they didn't succeed. But you've succeeded with one drone strike. You're creating more people to kill you, as you pointed out. And the same is true of the Osama bin Laden assassination. It, uh, uh, first of all, the, the action itself was extremely hazardous. The, uh, the Navy SEALs who were sent in were under orders to shoot their way out if they got into any trouble. Well, if they'd started, the Pakistani army is a professional army, they're committed, committed to the defense of the country and sovereignty of the country. If they had been caught there and tried to shoot their way, shoot their way out, they wouldn't have been left alone. The American forces next door would have come in and massive force, and uh, you know, we might have been involved in a nuclear war. Um, it was quite possible that was part of the threat. But there was something else that happened. It's been reported recently, I think, in Scientific American. Uh, but it was known. I mean, the, uh, the, the way that they identified bin Laden was through a fraudulent vaccination, vaccination campaign. Uh, they had doctors posing uh, to uh, do uh, anti-polio vaccination in a, uh, uh, in a uh, the poor area of uh, this town. Well, they pretty soon figured out it's not the poor area, it's the rich area. So they stopped the program in the middle, which is criminal in itself. Actually, running the program was criminal, you know, using uh, a, vaccina a, a vaccination program and doctors to try to apprehend the suspect. I mean, uh, that violates the principles going back to the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, but uh, then they stopped it in the middle because they thought they were in the wrong area, more crimes. Uh, then they finally identified him. But one consequence of their actions was to there is all, always in these societies serious concern about what uh, outsiders, Americans, are up to when they come in and start, uh, you know, uh, uh, sticking needles in people and so on. It's always there. It takes a lot of work to overcome that hostility, and it was being overcome in Pakistan. Now it's gone. Uh, they will not permit.
people to come in and carry out vaccinations. But polio is almost gone in the world. Pakistan's one of the last places where it survives. Okay, we're encouraging the spread of polio. And as one commentator pointed out, back to the Yemeni in the Senate, uh, one of these days people are going to look at this crippled child and say, you did it to us. And you can guess what's going to happen then. Um, if you missed uh, that testimony in the Senate, in the first ever Senate drone hearings, of this young Yemeni activist and freelance journalist. You can go to democracynow.org because last Wednesday we played it in full. <laughs> uh, and you can watch him and also read the transcript. But um, Noam, I wanted to ask you to follow up on Jeremy's opening point around the killing and closing point, the killing of Americans um, uh, <clears throat> versus people anywhere. Well, I, uh, Jeremy's point is exactly right. And uh, the, 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 the murder of Aulaki, and we should be honest about it, was, uh, you take a look at the New York Times the next day. There was a headline which said something like, West, West celebrates death of radical cleric. You know, Good, we murdered a radical cleric. Then concerns began to mount over the fact that he was an American. And a bit of a problem should be darn killing Americans. And that's pretty scandalous, I'll just to reiterate what Jeremy said. It doesn't matter whether they're Americans or whatever they are, they're people. Uh, going back to Magna Carta, the concept of people free of these, uh, should be free of state terror, has been expanded over the years, substantially. Uh, and it should be expanded to include people. Uh, they should be free of state terror. Uh, and uh, uh, I should say that I, myself, I'm kind of hesitant about some of the things I, I do myself. But right now I'm a plaintiff in a suit on the, against the NDAA, it's the NDAA proposals of Obama's latest National Defense Organization Act includes, includes provisions which uh, make it uh, which optional for the government, if it chooses, to place American citizens under uh, uh, indefinite detention in military prisons. There's an incredible crime. You know? Again, back to Magna Carta, much worse. And uh, uh, Chris Hedges uh, organized a suit to, to try to oppose this, and I signed on, but with reservations. Because what difference does it make if they're American citizens? I mean, the same NDAA Act uh, authorized, in fact, makes it mandatory in some circumstances for the uh, government to uh, place non-American citizens under uh, indefinite preventive detention. Should be that's what we should be. That's what we should be concerned with. This suit, incidentally, has taken an interesting course. Uh, Obama originally had said that. He was opposed to those provisions in the act when he would sign it. Then when the case went to court, at the lower court level, the, uh, the government uh, case, uh, the uh, plaintiffs won. The uh, judge threw out the government uh, uh, prosecution uh, on the court because the, uh, the, pros the prosecution refused to answer a simple question. Will these plaintiffs be subject to uh, administrative detention? Could they be? And they refused to answer that, so the, the judge threw that out. Obama immediately took it to the higher court. That shows you how much opposed he is to it. It'll work its way to the Supreme Court. And given the Supreme Court, uh, they'll all probably win. Uh, well, you know, these are things we should really be concerned about. It's not. If you want to know what, I'm sure you all know, but if you really want to know in detail what happens to non-citizens, read some of the testimonies. So, for example, the recent book that came out by an Australian, uh, David, David Hill, I think his name is, uh, very much worth reading. Uh, he's a, a young man who was uh, hiking around somewhere in 
northern Afghanistan. David, was David picked, Hicks. Hmm? David Hicks. David Hicks, yeah. He was picked up by the, uh, by the Northern Alliance, the U.S. allies. Uh, they sold him for bounty to the American forces. And then he describes his years in Bagram, and then at Guantanamo, six, seven years, the torture, the sadism, the cruelty are just indescribable. These are American soldiers, you know, elite American soldiers. You just really have to read that. To, I mean, if anybody knows American history, it won't surprise you that much, but it's right in front of our eyes. And he, he said something quite interesting in his testimony, which I was struck by. He, he says the soldiers, of course, these guys were shackled, bound, you know, couldn't move, uh, surrounded by uh, all kinds of uh, military police and so on. But he said the guards were afraid of the prisoners. He said the guards had been so brainwashed uh, by whatever training they went through that they thought these prisoners were superhuman. He said the guards would come to his cell sometimes where he's shackled and, you know, and so on and ask him to perform some of his feats. Like, you know, climb on the ceiling, show you show us how you do it. This kind of thing. And in fact, when they took them out to be interrogated, you know, they had a, like a platoon of Marines around them to make sure that they didn't carry out some incredibly monstrous act that these uh, soldiers have probably seen in a video movie somewhere. Uh, they, they, but he said they really were terrified of the prisoners. And that tells us something else about our own society. That what are we doing to our own society when we're creating such a terror and fear among ordinary people? I mean, it's, it's kind of like having guns and you know, armed, uh, uh, armed policemen in schools. Is that what you want your children to see? That uh, we live in a society where you have to have a, a people with guns around to protect you from some uh, unimaginable danger. And uh, here was another serious, as far as American culture is concerned, something we should be concerned about. Uh, this is a very frightened society. Always has been. It goes back to colonial times. It's very striking. Today it is taking a remarkable force. If you look at the, you know, the gun culture, the people who are pressing for having guns are terrified. A lot of them are simply terrified. They're like these guards standing outside the prison. What are they terrified of? They've got to have guns to protect themselves from who? The federal government, the, the United Nations, Aliens, whoever it may be. We don't know what horrible force is coming after us, but we have to have guns to protect ourselves. I mean, put aside the fact that guns wouldn't be any good and probably kill each other, but the fear throughout the society is simply incredible. Can I? Jeremy. Yeah. Just a, a couple of things in, in, uh, in response there. The, I, I was remembering when you were talking about uh, David Hicks' story. Um, this, uh, this case that I came across in, um, in, in Yemen um, of a journalist named Abdullah Haider Shaya. Um, at, when, when, the, when, when President Obama first authorized the bombing of Yemen uh, was in uh, December of 2009. The, the first strike that we know of authorized under the Obama administration was on December 17, 2009 in Yemen. Uh, there hadn't been a bombing, a U.S. bombing there that we know of since November of 2002. Uh, the first drone strike, actually, that, uh, that was conducted outside of Afghanistan um, was in Yemen in 2002, and it killed a number of people, including a, a U.S. citizen named Kamal Darwish. Um, and, uh, and he actually was not, um, uh, was not supposedly the target of that strike, but they claim that he had ties to a, um, a, a terror cell called the Lackawanna Six, which, like many of the plots we've seen lately, seem to have been, the, in large part, the FBI breaking up its own plot, um, and, which is really scandalous if you look at how many times this has happened and, and all these cases have been trapped. Um, but so President Obama starts, decides to start bombing Yemen in December of 2009. They do this strike on what they are told by the Yemeni government and by US intelligence is an Al-Qaeda training camp, and that there is this notorious Al-Qaeda 
figure who's known to be in the camp. Well, it turned out that this guy, when, when we investigated it and went to Yemen and spoke to people that knew him and knew the infrastructure of AQAP, that he was an old jihadist who had fought in the Mujahideen War in Afghanistan and, and, and had a very peripheral connection to Al Qaeda. So it seems like what happened is that you know, the US outsources a lot of its intelligence gathering in Yemen to um, notoriously corrupt uh, Yemeni officials and agencies and, uh, and to the Saudis. And the Saudis have their own war that they're waging inside of Yemen. The US-backed dictatorship of Ali Abdullah Saleh was playing multiple sides, playing the Saudis, playing the US, playing various tribes inside the country. There were several occasions when Saleh fed the US intelligence, saying someone was Al-Qaeda, and it turned out to be a political opponent of the regime that was being killed or assassinated um, by, by the US on behalf and the service of the dictator of Yemen. And so in this case, in December 17, 2009, they, they bombed this village supposedly to kill this one guy who does not seem to have been anything even vaguely resembling a senior Al-Qaeda figure in the country. And, and, uh, and after the, the missile strike happens, um, the Yemeni government puts out a press release taking credit for the strike, saying it had conducted these airstrikes. And the Obama administration congratulated the Yemeni government on taking the fight to the terrorists in Yemen. Uh, a number of tribal leaders in Yemen got phone calls from this small, poor Bedouin village called Al Majula uh, that this missiles had slammed into the area and had shredded people into meat. And these tribal leaders went there, and also a young, this young journalist, Abdullah Haider Shaya, who had done reporting and work for the Washington Post, for ABC News, for Al Jazeera. He was a very, very well-known journalist in Yemen. And, and he was known because he was a brave guy who would go and actually interview Al-Qaeda figures. Much of what the United States knows about uh, certain leaders in Al-Qaeda come comes from the reporting of Abdullah Haider Shaya. He, if you, you could look at it one way and say it was, he was a very valuable guy to have out talking to these people because it helped the US intelligence officials understand, or operatives understand, who it was they were supposedly trying to kill. Um, and that, but that's, that's for a different story. So this guy goes there, these tribal leaders go there, and they, they take photographs of the missile parts. And they then share, show them, broadcast them on Al Jazeera and other outlets, and share them with Amnesty International. And Amnesty International has a, uh, a weapons expert come in and analyze them, and they determined that they were, uh, that there, it was a cruise missile attack. And, and, uh, and when, when Rick and I were in Abiyan province, we had the parts filmed. They're still there in the desert, by the way. You can go, if you want to try to go to El Manjil, you can go there, and they're still in the middle of the desert. Uh, with general dynamics and made in the USA right there, visible, and we show this in our film. We show the, the aftermath of this bombing and, uh, and the missile parts that were still there you know, at well after the bombs had dropped. But the US also, but the, the, the other web, uh, bombs that they found there were cluster bombs, which of course are banned under, under international conventions. And, uh, the cluster bombs are basically, I, I saw the effect of them when the U.S. was using them in the Kosovo War in 1999. I, I went to the niche marketplace after it was bombed um, in Serbia and saw the aftermath of it. They're like flying landmines, and they shred everything in its path into, into meat and limbs, and it is horrifying to see the aftermath of any bombing, but cluster bombs are a particularly brutal weapon. And there were unexploded cluster bombs that were left there. And after the bombing had taken place, some children were playing near a cluster bomb and picked one of them up and it blew them to pieces uh, two days after the bomb, bombing had happened. So they take these pictures, they send them to Amnesty International, and these sheikhs, tribal sheikhs, organized a gathering to say that this is not the Yemeni government that did this because Yemen doesn't have these missiles. Amnesty does an analysis of them and determines that they were, in fact, US weapons and that only the United States could have been responsible for that bombing. And so this sort of scandal was brewing inside of Yemen because the people who were killed there, there were at least 46 people killed. Um, 14 of the people killed were women and 21 were children. Uh, when the Yemeni parliament, which is, is a, which is supported by the United States, went to investigate it, they listed all of the dead, their ages, their names, their genders, and I got a, a, a copy of that report and, and have the list of every single person that we know of that was killed in that strike. And we added it up and it was, 14 women and 21 children among the 46 dead. And uh, in the pursuit of trying to kill this one person who the President of the United States had been told was this high value target who everyone in Yemen says was a, an older Mujahideen who had primarily done his jihad in Afghanistan and not inside of Yemen. 
When this started to become public, this Yemeni journalist was going on Al Jazeera and was helping other US media outlets report that story, that it was in fact a US strike. US officials were denying it and eventually then anonymously said, yes, we were behind the strike, but General David Petraeus said that uh, no civilians were actually killed in the strike and that it's all a big exaggeration, which was very offensive to Yemenis of all political stripes, and so it was an enduring scandal. And this one journalist was really pushing this story. And he continued to report on other, on the expanding US air war in Yemen. And one night, in the middle of the night, he was, uh, he, in the middle of the day, he was out with a friend of his who was a political cartoonist and they were shopping, and he was snatched by US-backed, uh, US trained counterterrorism forces in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, and was taken to the political security prison and was beaten uh, bloody by the security services and told that he was to stop talking about the missile strikes. And then they released him onto the streets. And what this journalist did was to go straight to Al Jazeera and say, I was just beaten by the political security officers and, and they're trying to stop me from talking about the US missile strikes that are happening um, in the country. And, and soon after he did that, his house was raided by the, the CTU, the counterterrorism unit, which is a JSOC and CIA trained entity. And they snatched him out of his home and disappeared him for 30 days. And no one knew where he was. And then they hauled him into a court that has been specifically set up by the dictatorship to prosecute journalists for crimes against the state. And, and was ultimately convicted of being uh, I, an Al-Qaeda facilitator, because he facilitated Al-Qaeda members being able to speak to the media. And, uh, and which I've talked to people in US intelligence who, who, who actually also believe that this case is outrageous, because they said you took off the streets one of the best reporters that we would read who, so we could actually understand what was going on in Yemen because of the notorious corruption of all of the informants. So he is put into this prison, he's put on trial, total sham trial, his lawyers refused to present a defense, no lawyer would represent him at his own request because he said, I don't want to recognize a shred of legitimacy of this process. And we have video of him when he is in prison. They bring him in front of the, in, into the courtroom in a, in a cell. They have him in a cage in the cell. And as they're pulling him away, he said, my crime is exposing the American missile attack on the tiny Bedouin village of Al-Majla in Abiyan province. They're putting me in jail because I exposed their cruise missile attack. And, the, and he said, this is what happens when, when, when Yemeni journalists are real journalists and they pull him away and, they, and they, they, they disappear him into this prison. There was so much outrage in Yemen from his tribe and from, from human rights organizations and from mainstream civil society in Yemen that the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh had no choice but to issue a pardon against Abdullah Haider Shaya. This happens a lot in Yemen. Someone gets arrested, the tribes protest, and then the person is released. It's a whole, it's a game that's been playing out in that country for a long time. So he's, he's going to issue a pardon, and the official news service, the Sabah News Agency, does a report saying that, that this journalist is going to be pardoned. That day, the dictator of Yemen receives a phone call from the White House not from some liaison, not from Secretary of State, from President Obama himself, personally. And President Obama tells the dictator of Yemen that he's deeply concerned about news that Abdullah al-Haider Shia is going to be released and the pardon is torn up. Unless you think I'm making this up or I've just heard it secondhand, I know this because the White House put it on their own website in a readout of the phone call from that day. And when I called the State Department to ask them, this is a year and a half after Abdul al Haider had been in prison since his phone call. What is the U.S. State Department's position on Abdul al Haider Shia? They said our position remains the same as that articulated by President Obama in that phone call. We believe he should be kept in prison. So this journalist is in prison because of the President of the United States making a phone call and having his pardon ripped up. And he's not doing well in prison. I'm in touch with his family. He's, uh, my understanding is that he's losing, he's starting to lose his mind, which is very common with people that are kept in solitary confinement or in these uh, conditions. And, and, and none of the news organizations that worked with him in the US, ABC News, Washington Post, and none of them have said anything about his case. Not, where are they? When he's getting them sensationalist footage, when, they, when he interviewed Anwar al laki they all wanted to broadcast his comments about Nadal Hassan, you know, who conducted the massacre at Fort Hood, Texas. 
And they wanted to ask, uh, they wanted to know what al Laki said about the underwear bomber. You know why we know what al Laki thought about that? Because Abdullah Haider Shia found him, interviewed him, and published it in the Washington Post on NBC. And yet when he's in prison, they say nothing. It's shameful. It's shameful. And, and, and that's often what happens in these cases. Journalists, <laughs> journalists like, like myself and others, we go into these countries. And, and, and you know, I, I encourage people to read the acknowledgments in my book because I tell you, I, I name the names of all of the journalists in Yemen and Somalia and Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world who made it possible for this story to be told. Um, and they're the real heroes of this. Unfamous journalists who report oftentimes not in English take the great risks. People like me, I go in and I can go somewhere for a few weeks or a month and I depend on them to be able to tell these stories. And, and when, so when something happens to one of our colleagues, Somalia journalists are being gunned down in record numbers. In Yemen, journalists are being thrown in prison. If we don't speak up when we have a platform and, and defend our colleagues, we should be ashamed of ourselves. And we should be ashamed to, to call ourselves journalists. You know, as we wrap up, this is the week that the uh, Bush uh, library is being opened in Dallas, uh, where there is an evaluation, a reevaluation going on of his record. It's the 10th anniversary of the war in Iraq. And today we're talking about the years of the Obama administration. Can you talk about President Obama's record? Well, let me tell you what I felt, and maybe some of the rest of you felt, when I saw the pictures of the Bush Library presentation. Uh, there was a group of men standing there, former presidents, the ones who are alive. Uh, every one of them is a major criminal. A major <laughs> is continuing the grand tradition, which would be a great surprise. And I, I guess the, the sentence that came to my mind at the time is actually from Thomas Jefferson, who uh, said once that, uh, he said, I tremble for my country when I think that God is just and someday will bring us to his judgment. Well, if we can't bring them to some kind of judgment either, if not in the courts, uh, at least in public opinion, then I like what Jeremy said, we're not doing our our a duty just as responsible people. And let, <laughs> Jeremy, we're going to end with you. Uh, this is your second major book. Your first book was Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army, where you really reframed you reframed the whole discussion about mercenaries and the privatization of the U.S. military. Suffice it to say, here we are, what, um, six years later, and Eric Prince had to move the founder of Blackwater to Abu Dhabi, and you remain here in the United States. <laughs> with this second book, and Jeremy's going to be signing afterwards, and I encourage everyone to get this book, um, not just for interesting summer reading, but that we can see uh, a spring and a summer of uh, U.S. foreign policy. When we are informed what a difference it makes to begin with those tools, uh, to be empowered to challenge uh, what we how we are represented in the rest of the world. But I want to ask you, Jeremy, finally, your new book is called Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. What are you hoping to accomplish with this book and uh, why you even call it Dirty Wars? One, one, uh, one thing that I think you'll notice if you, if you read the book, um, you know, I, I uh, I've talked to friends about the, you know, when I wrote Blackwater, I, I think I've grown up a lot since I wrote that book in, in a sense because um, something really strange happened to me after I wrote Blackwater and that was that I started to get 
uh, emails and, uh, and other electronic communications from, uh, from people that had served in special operations forces or worked with the CIA. Um, not senior officials, I don't hobnob with the powerful ever. Um, in fact, when I was talking about this official who told me what he said about the killing of Abdul Rahman, I had to chase him around the campus of a university I found him on, and, and you know, he did not want to speak to me. I had to sort of uh, chase him. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the only interaction I have with powerful officials is chasing them somewhere. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I started to get uh, communications from operators and people that were doing these operations and you know there was a sort of a pattern to them early on and sometimes they would come to events and come up to me afterwards and, and they'd say you know I don't a lot of them would say I don't care very much for your politics but you were totally right about Blackwater you know, can't stand them and I, I got to know uh, people in that world in that community because they also were had problems with Blackwater and didn't like various actions or problems that the company's actions had caused for their units or the fact that they were getting paid so much more than the conventional soldiers, whatever it was. Um, but I started a dialogue with, uh, with some of these people that continues to this day and I've learned a tremendous amount from them about how these operations run and what I tried to do in the book, I mean I hope I succeeded to a degree with it, is to weave in and out of stories that show the complicated landscape of the killing fields and the uh, the men who do the operations on the ground, the figures who are identified as the targets, the civilians that are forced to live on the other side of the barrel of the gun or in the place where the bombs are going off, and to put it in a, a historical context. Um, I think if you had asked me years ago what I think, you know, what I wanted to accomplish or what I think should be done, I would have pretended to have an answer um, because I think it's, I was, you know, I was bullheaded. Um, I, I think that we, unfortunately are only at the very beginning of a conversation that we have to, that's urgent and that we have to have in this country about how far we as a society have let things to go, let things go since 9-11 in the name of protecting our security. And I, I, I concur very much with what uh, Noam said about being gripped by fear. Um, you know, fear is a very powerful force. And if you don't figure out a way to confront it, and not be owned by it, then things like the Patriot Act happen, and uh, and civil liberties get rolled back, and uh, you know people say, oh, NDAA, the people that are whining about that are crazy, and it's conspiracy theory, and all of these things, and you just have just study history. It starts somewhere. It starts with an idea, and then a crisis happens, and they implement the idea that's been laying around. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a very age old concept, and uh, my hope is that people use the book as actionable intelligence, uh, which is actually an intel you know, a term in the, in the CIA or in the targeting business. But I want it to be actionable intelligence to uh, work toward a democratic process of confronting our own fear and also holding those in power accountable whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Mm -hmm. I think all of us should be defined not by the public pronouncements of politicians, but by what we do in response to the actions they're doing in our name. And um, that's the spirit I wrote this book. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. I'll, I'll record. check in with you after I drop off. No, about tonight. We'll get, your, we'll get everyone in. We'll get everyone in.